Hello, welcome everyone to uh, a vacation edition of the No Emotion podcast. I'm on vacation, Jacob's not, but this is um, Jacob Claver. He's got lots of keen insights into the business that he operates, well, multiple businesses, um, as we've talked about uh, off camera. And I want to get some insights from Jacob today about mostly about custody and some insights that he has in those things, specifically with, well, which 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 companies are we talking about here when we talk about custody? Well, so for digital assets, the only company that really handles that piece specifically with no conflicts is Standard Custody and Trust, which is a subsidiary of PolySign. Okay, so what, what do you know? Tell us, tell us all the tell us all the details. Uh, well, so I, I had the privilege of, of meeting with them last week, which was fantastic. Um, I, I watched a fireside chat between Jack McDonald and Joe, who is the COO of Link2. And so um, because of the things that I'm working on with the Digital Family Office, Digital Ascension Group, I'm the director there. Uh, we have a full suite of professionals that will help you uh, manage your wealth after a digital asset liquidity event. So, you know, your audience and, and myself included uh, believe that we'll see some price appreciation for particular assets. And so um, because of that, I selfishly put together this profile of professionals. And then once I started speaking to the community about that, realized that other people were not doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, once I figured that out, I thought, you know, I, I should cater a business around this and put together something that's going to be helpful for people when that happens. So that's yeah. what I've done. And then the other component uh, that that kind of spurred me to reach out to PolySign and, and these different subsidiaries is in that discussion, um, Jack had spoke about the acquisition for MG Stover. And MG Stover does the accounting fund management uh, back end piece for raising funds and SPVs, all different kinds of funds. If you're going to pool capital together uh, in a legal way and invest it in something, they manage all that. And uh, I think PolySign's done a fantastic job of, of putting together a full spectrum of all of the companies that you would want uh, under one umbrella for digital assets in financial services. And so he mentioned that, and, and we're raising or we would like to raise we'll see if everything works out i think we will um for a master node on xdc's network through through the mastermind and the dow that i put together and so we partnered with syndicate lee who does spvs and they're fantastic uh, but they will not allow you to raise in kind so what that means is they won't allow you to raise in cryptocurrency you have to raise the money in fiat and then deploy that capital however the person you're giving it to sees fit, right? And so uh, with MG Stover, we can raise in XDC or you can raise in XRP or, or whatever other cryptocurrency, you know, you want to use. Um, and that will be within the next 30 days that, that kind of happens uh, for them. They're looking to deal with institutions that, you know, have somewhere between 25 million and 50 million of assets under management or greater. Uh, and that's at the point it kind of makes sense to pay their fee, which is $60,000 a year. I, I think we should be able to cover that and actually make this happen for the XDC raise. So fingers crossed, we'll be the the first ever uh, firm to, to raise in crypto for a crypto investment um, without having to raise any fiat. And so we shout out to them. Um, and because of their affiliation with the other subsidiaries uh, that PolySign has under their umbrella, um, was also able to meet with Standard Custody and Trust and have conversations with them about custodying assets for the digital family office, uh, which is kind of what you wanted to talk about today. Yeah. So what what did you discover in that in that phone call? Um, because I've also been in touch with um, them as well, just via email, kind of dig in to see, you know, are you going to let us have our XRP over there or what? <laughs> um, and their response at the time was, um, no, we're not going to support that, but here are a list of tokens that we do support. And it was basically all the Bitcoin-y, Ethereum-y type tokens. Um, what do you see in the future for these X assets that we love so much? So currently, I'm not aware that they support XLM or uh, XDC. Um, it's not to say that they won't, 
when I had the conversation with them, they said that they have 31 assets that they currently support. They're looking to add two or three more, uh, and then also some smart contract and DeFi protocols. So um, they do support XRP. And if you are accredited already, you can custody your assets with PolySign. Uh, previous to that conversation, on their other literature and website, I, I looked up that they only wanted to deal with institutions or bodies that had $150 million of net worth or, or higher. And mm -hmm. so I thought that we would have to pool our XRP together inside of an SPV or another fund, and then we could go direct with them in order to gain yield uh, and, and deal out the distributions. So I was prepared for that, and that's kind of why I set up the things that I set up. Yep. Uh, but it, it seems that um, they are willing to, well, they're going to allow accredited investors to, to partner directly with them. So mm -hmm. um, if you have digital assets and they are something that they custody currently, you are able to partner with them and they will hold those for you. Yeah. So one of the things that they gave me as guidance was a link to the SEC's definitions of accredited investors, which was actually really good. That was a great rabbit hole to go down because... I'm not American, so I don't usually pay attention yeah. to much of this stuff, but apparently the SEC, everyone around the world is becoming experts in the SEC, um, which is really funny to think about. Um, but one thing that I didn't get out of them was the yield aspect. This is something that I've been talking about for ages and how this is going to be happening, right? This is that there's got to be an incentive to give the crypto over. Um, what what kind of did they discuss yields or anything or did you have any insight into that i i didn't pursue that discussion with them because it didn't really pertain to the reasons yeah. i had contacted them uh however i can give you my speculation if you'd okay. like we like that uh, <laughs> so in the previous conversation we had we had discussed xrp becoming um a tier one asset inside the banking system and so it's premium collateral. And in order to have derivatives, you have to post collateral. Uh, currently, people use U.S. Treasuries for that, and they currently pay 4 and 5% on, on most U.S. Treasuries. So just spitballing, that's, that's about what I think they would pay for other Tier 1 collateral inside the banking system. Maybe it's some type of bond um, that they issue against it, and it's paid out on a regular basis similar to that, right? So that would be my speculation. Uh, and, and that's gonna depend on interest rates as well, if, if the Fed were to continue to hike interest rates. Um, but in a new global economy uh, where it's a level playing field, which is where we all think this is going, I don't know that they will be able to dictate what other countries do with their interest rates like they do now. Mm. And so, to, to have a sustainable economy long term, you need somewhere between four and six percent on interest rates as a minimum because it incentivizes people to loan their money out. Right. If you're making a yield lower than that, then it, why would you do it? So that, that makes the most sense to me is, you know, somewhere between four and six percent on an annual basis is, is what they would pay out for, you know, holding your XRP. And then if if you were to uh use as use it as collateral and post collateralized loans in order to you know have tax-free income which we talk about um and, and i'll just go over that for the viewers that aren't aware i'm sure they are if they watch your channel but uh if you take a loan against an asset that's not taxable and that's across all jurisdictions it doesn't matter what country you're in um loans against collateral that that are due back to whoever you took the loan from uh they're they're not taxable so that's my preferred way of yeah. of leveraging uh, these assets long term. So you would you would stake that, and you would, you would likely pay an interest rate higher than what they would pay you on the um, the yield if you were to stake it with them or or lease it to them. So you probably would owe you know six or seven percent uh, on your collateralized loans, and and that would just run until you paid it back. Yeah. So my initial thought process on that, because I, I, I've when I've heard the inner workings of different banks and stuff, and when they, when they start discussing yields for for holding crypto, because 
I don't really know the en entirely how the hierarchy of it will all be. Like, you know how XRP work, will work as the rails, like the technology will be the rails for the payments system. You won't necessarily see XRP in your typical pr payments, but it, it's all happening underneath. So when we talk about like Barclays, for example, who I think they acquired Copper, who's like a custodianship wallet service type <laughs> thing, then BNY Mellon, who are already openly talking about custody, all kinds of banks. Are those banks using the underlying tech, which is PolySign tech, or do they have their own well, systems in so, place? I'll give you what I uncovered. Okay. Um, and this is complete speculation. It was not verified. So just, just take it with a grain of salt. Uh, in that same conversation where Jack was speaking with Joe, uh, he mentioned a different subsidiary that I had never heard of before called Atomic Net. Mm -hmm. And I knew that this is something that they were working on because you you want to reduce counterparty risk in transactions. Uh, it's none of this, you know, I'll send you this and then you send me that. You know, you don't. The way that that works for their system is uh, both parties send whatever is supposed to be transacted into smart contract. And that smart contract holds them in escrows mm -hmm. on either side of the transaction until the stipulations or whatever specified in the smart contract is met, it will then execute and it will send the assets that are locked in the escrows to the opposite party at the exact same time. So there's no counterparty risk of the other person reneging and, and not doing what they said they were going to do, okay. which is great. Um, and so that's what he kind of explained uh, Atomic Net as. And so I went, I went to Google to try to find it immediately. Right. Um, and in doing so, there's no website. PolySign has been very in the background, uh, not talked about for a long time. And they've just now started to come out into the public and kind of be a little bit more open. Uh, but with Atomic Net, they told me that there's still a lot of NDAs and, and things that they can't discuss in my meeting with them when I asked about it. They said that they would send me a one one page report on it, which I still haven't seen. But um, they, they said they could show me a demo, but if they showed me the demo, I'd have to sign NDAs. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I digress. When, when I went to go look for this online, uh, there was no website, and I did some deeper digging and found a patent. And on that patent, it had been abandoned, which I thought was odd. Uh, but further down, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can see all the other patents that reference a patent. And there were hundreds of patents filed by every large institution that you could think of wow. uh, referencing that patent. So is that the XRPL? Is that DLT? Uh, I didn't, and I didn't ask them the specific patent number. I just mentioned that progression of events and they said that was some good detective work. <laughs> so um, didn't, you know, verify, didn't, didn't say it was wrong. Just, you know, if you're on the right path type deal. Um, so that that makes me believe that that yes, there's they're gonna leverage this technology, whether that's the the blockchain that's proprietary to PolySign uh, or the XRPL. That's that's to be seen. Um, they did state. I mean, you you've got Arthur Brito and, and David Schwartz from Ripple. They have another lady from Ripple there. It, it would make sense to me that the XRPL is integrated in some capacity with their technology. However, you know, there's there's nothing we can be sure of. And I they do have a blockchain that's proprietary to PolySign that's not a public blockchain. So maybe it's that one and then we'll all get rugged. But <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's likely. Yeah, just it doesn't feel likely based on the the origins of the people involved. Um it, these are the dots. This is the whole environment right now, basically. We're speculating on what make sense right and all the dots all the paths point to one place but none of it's completely confirmed which is the most frustrating part um but my my where i was going with my previous question that uh that that was kind of setting the foundation for that that question was i've heard banks talking like santander for example talking about 12 to 25 percent yields and really if these are accurate numbers and the, and then the polysign thing is between you know 4 and 6 let's say 
how were they doing that? <laughs> how are they doing that extra yield? Doesn't make sense. What articles specifically did you see those? Oh, it, this this is in? this is word of mouth. There's not not really articles okay. about this. So, you know, it, I I can quite easily see the the side of you know verifiable truth that you're kind of coming out of meetings with. Um, yeah, I mean. Um... I'm very cautious of anything that generates more than eight to 12% interest on an annual basis, just because it's not sustainable long-term. When, when uh, Terra Luna was touting that they could give you 20% yield uh, on UST and everybody was staking with them, we saw what happened there with that debacle. Yep. Um, junk bonds, you, you can generate those types of yields in traditional markets if you want to play in the junk bond market. But again, those are like, bad creditors that are that are looking for money right and so it's uh, there's a high potential that they're not going to fulfill on their obligation and pay that junk bond right. and so you can trade them and make some money or, or play in options or do some different things but as far as just holding them again there's just a high level of risk with anything associated with those types of interest rates so that's that's why i believe it'll be lower but uh, for me, let's say, okay, <clears throat> we'll talk about the crazy prices it could go to just for a second. Yeah. We'll, we'll go to fantasy land. Um, let's say, you know, it's it's five years from now and Codius is online and they have the derivatives market and it's, it's regulated and there's an accounting mechanism behind it, which is great. And you have to post the collateral and you can't loan it out to somebody else and do the same thing multiple times. So maybe it's not quite, you know, 1.4 quadrillion dollars maybe it's just under a, a quadrillion dollars in derivatives because it's regulated and there's oversight which is which would be great it'd be it prevent a lot of the issues that happened in 08 that's still a, a ridiculous amount of liquidity that xrp would have to provide for just just that market so four four or five digits isn't outlandish if if that's the mechanism that's used and that's the market that's being um allowed to operate on top of the XRPO or, or DLT. So let's say you had, you know, uh, maybe 10,000 XRP and it, they're $10,000 a piece. Uh, even if they raise the, the accredited investor requirements to $10 million, you would then still meet that threshold. Yep. And uh, a 5% yield on, on $10 million is 500 grand a year. Yep. Like that's in the current environment, even with, you know, rising interest rates and liquidity drying up and um, the cost of living rising and inflation running wild. That's you're still good. Yep. You know what I mean? Like you're well taken care of if you're making half a million dollars a year. So uh, that's what seems most likely to me um, and is sustainable. It's none of this. None of these crazy DeFi yields that have caused all these problems with, with Celsius and Voyager and, and some of these other ones, like the SEC is now coming after staking. So I just, I think things will regress to the norm. There's been a lot of money made while this, this space has been unregulated, but uh, in order for it to be brought to the masses and accepted and used in the same capacity as the traditional system, it, it's got to kind of fall within those similar guidelines yeah it's uh on one hand i it's disappointing to to hear that 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 kind of truth of it and and actually i i think what you're saying is completely reasonable um that we should return to the norm um what's what's slightly annoying for me is that you know if you if you invest in those uh in a standard, I guess, ETF or the S&P 500 or whatever, and it just typically performs at like 7%. Why wouldn't you just do that? <laughs> but the, but the, the, the thing I've always thought about the stock market and the potentially how crypto will be after all of this craziness hopefully happens is that the crypto market and the stock market, both regulated environments will just act similar with just diff different assets. And really there'll be overlap because you'll be tokenizing stocks anyway. Um, Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying the video. I want to introduce today's sponsor of this part of the video, 
And that is Bybit, where you can buy your XRP and your XLM, move to cold storage, trade it, do whatever you want. It's a trusted and reliable exchange where you can get hold of these assets that we love so much. They also have deposit bonuses and all kinds of things for you to generate extra money on their platform. And to show them how great this community is and how much you get behind me, please, please, use the link in the description or when you go over to Bybit, use the code LULU to get extra benefits and bonuses and also to let them know that I sent you. Let's get back to the episode. I, I'm hopeful that there is um, a lack of correlation. So in, in a diversified portfolio, if it's managed correctly, you, you would like to have assets that were inversely correlated. So the stock market goes down, bonds go up. And that's traditionally how you know most people have done it with a 60-40 split, and they'll make those allocations and move accordingly. I don't really like that because they haven't been inversely correlated uh, for the last little period here, and so that's caused a lot of problems for people. But with these assets becoming utility assets and the price being driven um, by you, the utility of the asset and the liquidity it's providing versus the speculation that currently exists on exchanges, I'm hopeful that there will be a break in that correlation. And this will actually be a fantastic play for all investors to hold, you know, a, I don't want to say substantial, but a decent portion of their portfolio in a diversified bag of, of crypto assets that have real world utility because they wouldn't be correlated with the stock market. Uh, and they would perform differently than uh, securities. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of like when everything we're, we're in this right now because we're we're early to uh, this new technology. We we're, we're going to ride that wave of whatever it that utility wave, and then afterwards we need to kind of reshape our minds not to think at that later level we would then want to make loads of money. It's not, that's not what it is. It's actually the preservation of your wealth after that point. And so a 5% yield is thumbs up because that's solid, regulated, 5% on a lot of money, you're done. Um, and so even with this very emotional situation or how, how emotional it can get, we need to bring ourselves into some sort of reality in that new situation. We're, bear in mind, we're still talking about having a hundred million dollars or whatever. <laughs> but but bringing yourself back down to earth and and understanding five percent is tremendous in such an environment. Yeah, the the wealthy <clears throat> just want return of their capital. They don't necessarily care about return on their capital. So as long as their wealth is maintaining whatever the inflation rate is, they're good. That's that's how you maintain your wealth over a long period of time. You just don't lose. The number one rule is don't lose money is yeah. what Warren Buffett says. Right. Yeah. And so you just want to put your money in places where there's asymmetrical bets uh, that it's going to be you know, likely that it pays out and it's going to be sustainable. Um, becoming wealthy and staying wealthy are two very different skills. And it, a lot of people are going to run into sudden wealth syndrome when this happens. Uh, if they don't have a plan in place, it's going to be difficult for them to have that money and not burn through it because it, they weren't taught the skill set that's needed to to manage that money because it is a skill set. And that's, that's what I've been working on the last three years, uh, partnering with these professionals and, and making sure things were in place prior to this liquidity event so that, you know, when this happens, I'm... I understand what needs done after that and I can maintain everything and it's kosher, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't need to chase the next, you know, big pump because I've, I've got my bag and I've got, you know, a yield that's maintains my lifestyle. I can purchase assets that pay for my other assets. So that that's what I'll be doing. And it may take a little bit longer. And so this is hard for people. Let's say you do make a couple million dollars and you, take that money, uh, most people are gonna leave it in their XRP, right, which is cool. If if uh, if it really is utility and you are able to get collateralized loans against it or earn a yield by leasing it out, that makes a lot of sense. However, um, you, you want to pay for your liabilities with the assets that you own. So maybe you take that capital and you buy some car washes and the cash flow from the car washes pays for your vehicle payment every month. Mm -hmm. Instead of buying that Lambo, you, you buy a car wash for the same amount of money. 
And then you could pay for your Lambo indefinitely. And when you get tired of that Lambo, you can swap to a different one and it'll make the payment on that. Um, that's, that's the way I think about things. And that's how the wealthy work. They, they acquire assets that pay for their lifestyle and, and liabilities. Yeah, exactly. That, and that, that marries up. It's, it's nice to speak to someone who's like really versed in it, say the same things as I've been like feeling and trying to communicate. Um, because a lot of what I've kind of accumulated in knowledge is just from reading some b- books, you know, <laughs> um, but I get really, like really, really into it. And so, um, I appreciate that insight. One of the the things that I was personally for my own strategy, everyone's going to be different. What my idea was just to buy tons of property um, and just have that property basically paying off a portion of my XRP that I've got coll- collateralized. Um, and so my, I'm wondering for you thinking about this a lot more than I do, what kind of, when, when it comes to, let's say polysign, even if it's not polysign for the staking element and then collateralizing, what kind of percentages are you working with? Staking 80, collateralizing 20? Like what, what, how does that work for you? Yeah. Um, so it depends on price appreciation and if if the assets actually has, has that capability for me. So I... Complete speculation, nothing said here is financial advice. Always consult with your financial advisor before making any investment decisions. Uh, this is for entertainment and educational purposes only. <laughs> so there's a disclaimer. Um, let's say in the short term it goes to like 50, you know, 10 to $50. And that that's what I think is most, most likely. If the lawsuit were to go Ripple's way, you would see a flood of all these institutions jump into XRP and buy it up off the secondary market. And price would still be driven by the APIs on exchanges. Okay. So you would see volume like nobody's ever seen before on an asset. It would be crazy. Um, and at that point, I plan on selling a pretty significant portion of my bag to take that capital and deploy it in other areas in my life, uh, upgrade my lifestyle, and also purchase assets that pay for my lifestyle and my other assets or, or liabilities that I have. Mm-hmm. So that that's short term. Uh, if I am able to stake or lease a portion of the assets and collateralize the loan on the other portion, it, dep- it depends on what the price goes to at that point. So let's let's say it's a hundred bucks, um, and there is utility, and it's just Swift that they have. And I know that long term, uh, DTCC. We've got the stock market. We've got all these other um, large pieces of liquidity and markets that will move onto the network. So I know the price will continue to go up over time. So at that point, I would probably just collateralize most of it. Uh, I wouldn't even loan it out or lease it because I know that the appreciation of the asset is going to pay it pay itself off over time. If it's still got another 100x to go, why not go ahead and take out some fat loans on it now while the price is still low in comparison to where it will be and just let the interest run because the price appreciation of the asset will outpace whatever the the, the interest I have to pay on it is. Right. Um, if it goes to something higher, say maybe a thousand, any, this also depends on how how high you think it goes long term too. Um, I would probably still do the same thing there because, I, in my opinion, and again, not financial advice, and this is you know pixie dust i'm just some guy on the internet don't listen to me uh i think you could see seven digit xrp 10 years from now if if it really if we're on mars if you've got all these other metaverses you've got all these economies and it's it's the back end settlement piece for for everything and it's got to transmit value between all of those jurisdictions and and people and financial institutions then i mean that's completely feasible so on derivatives, I didn't even say derivatives. Um, thousand, I'd still take collateralized loans against the majority of it, and then deploy that capital into assets. Because um, uh, I can, with my skill set and my network, I know that I can generate a larger yield on that money, the liquidity that I'm pulling out, than the four or five percent that I would get if I was just staking right. it. So it, it's an ROI for me. Uh, just because, again, I have connections that I know I could leverage it at a higher return. So 
that's going to be different for everybody. If, if you're older and uh, you have a lower risk tolerance and you don't necessarily have the connections or resources to generate something that's higher than a four or 5% yield, then it makes sense to just go ahead and lease it and, and live off that as your income. Um, and, that, and that's why it's so hard. Like I always say, this is not financial advice. I, I have meetings with people on a regular basis. I'm not a financial advisor or CPA, I'm not accredited or licensed in any capacity, just to be fully transparent. Um, but that also allows me to sit as an unbiased intermediary in your family office and give you a holistic advice on things where I'm not incentivized in any direction to make you choose one way or the other. I can just give you a, a real, um, somebody that understands this and a real perspective without any biases. So uh, I like it that way. I don't plan on becoming accredited or credentialed in any fashion just because it allows me to do that and really be that intermediary for people in the family office. So yeah, it, it's going to depend wildly on your your situation, your age, your risk tolerance, time horizon, all those things. But for me, that's because I'm in my early 30s. That makes the most sense. Yeah, uh, uh, this is so, so interesting to hear. I, I hadn't I, I had always viewed collateralization of a these assets as a smaller percentage. Um, maybe that does maybe that's accurate based on my connections and my understanding of how to generate higher yields outside. Maybe I'm 20% confident, you know, um, right. in being able to do that. So that's a really good way to break it down. Um, although after this, cause I feel like I do have a, and a good idea, maybe more than 20% confidence of how to generate a, a yield outside of crypto. Um, potentially that, that percentage goes up for me after this conversation. Um, What's interesting to me, though, is the initial sell of bags for you. Like, um, right. So, again, I have the resources to mitigate that tax obligation and the understanding of how to do so. Um, toward the end of last year, I was concerned that we'd see price appreciation close to Christmas. And if that was the case, it was going to be very difficult with that time horizon to get things offset. Um, but you can you you can move the fiscal year for your LLCs. So if you own your digital assets in your LLCs, you can move the fiscal year. Uh, I think it's once every ten years and shift it. Mm -hmm. So I could say you know that was the first day of my fiscal year <laughs> yep. when the price appreciation happened, and I got a whole year to figure out how to offset it. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do it. it I think people are scared of taxes. Uh, I think it's a fun game because of all the rules and regulations that are in place. And I'm I'm mostly familiar with the laws here in the US just because that's where I'm centered and that's where the professionals are that I work with. Uh, we, we have reached out to people in other jurisdictions. I've got a pretty extensive list of people in, in Canada, some in the UK, Australia as well. Um, so yeah, we're, we're working on putting together you know, some more professionals outside the U.S. to kind of help individuals across the globe as this happens. But yeah, so the charitable remainder trust, there's there's a lot of different ways that you could off, offset substantial um, liquidity events. Yep. And as long as you have the resources necessary to do so, I don't think it should be something that, that people are scared of, uh, especially if, if you can leverage that liquidity in that same time frame to generate a pretty significant yield, maybe even offset the, the taxes that you would owe. Yep. So yeah. Um, one of the, one of the things that I've been uh, thinking about and, and uh, really is the one thing that I was going to put into place was the whole idea of, you know, setting your fiscal year, as you said, but you can do that also by saying, uh, well, I established my company has actually been in operation in Dubai <laughs> you know, where there's 0% tax in the first place and it started on this date. So the gains that happened over this time happened in Dubai, which is 0% and um, mm. fascinating for sure, but a scary game to play without guidance. And I think that's the, um, the you've positioned yourself really well for what's coming really, really, really well. And I know, I know who I'm going to call when, when this <laughs> stuff happens, or at least I know everyone will be calling you, but um, I'll, I'll send you a text and just, you know, I, yeah, I, you got my number. Yeah, I, yeah. And I'll, I'll I'll take care of everybody that's that knows me now. Um, again, like 
and and everybody moving forward. I want to do my best for the entire community. That's that's why I've put together the team I have, um, and I'll have to figure out how to scale quickly in order to manage all of that. I feel competent and and confident that I can do that. Um, but yeah, it's going to be. I expect it to be a little overwhelming in the short term if if there were significant price appreciation. I will say, um, I talked about this with with T last night. If in the short term you are going to liquidate, if we did have a liquidity event where it ran like ten to fifty dollars, and you don't get long term utility with that, let's. So here's here's the other side of that situation. If if price is still driven by exchange volume, um, there's there's a little over two billion left in wallets that feed exchanges. That's it. Um, and then you've got retail, right? So maybe there's another $2 billion held by retail. And, and other people think it's more than that. That's just based on my research of the XRP rich list and, and some of the people I know. And anyway, so there's $4 billion globally that institutions could buy up off the secondary market. So you'd see a crazy run up in price as, as they were doing that. And then the volume on exchanges would start to drop because there wouldn't be any liquidity for them to continue buying. And so you would see the price plummet if if utilities not in place. Yeah. So you see this crazy spike and run up to ten to fifty dollars, and then maybe it drops back to a few dollars or even less. Um, that's maybe even cents, right? Because there's no volume. Yep. Um, people would be very disheartened at that point, right? They would see this giant pump. They could have sold. They had millions, and then they didn't do it. Um, <laughs> And so that's that's the other piece for me, and that's why I plan on taking some some good profit if that's the case, right? Because that's my expectation of of what happens, um, is that it will plummet back down after the the large run up, and so because of that, um, I think we're gonna have we'll just see we'll see what happens with utility. Like I said, I, I hate being that. like the the bearer of bad news on that one but i, I just want to make people prepare for all situations and kind of have a plan in place yeah well i think that's a completely sound strategy i i appreciate every second that you've given me here we will definitely do it again um i could listen to you talk about this stuff all day to be honest um but i've got to go and enjoy my vacation <laughs> um, Please do. i appreciate you taking the time uh where can people find you uh so you can find me on twitter i'm beyond broke on twitter uh, Jake Claver, um, on all other social media platforms, whether that's Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, um, you can go join the mastermind uh, at beyondbroke.club. Mm -hmm.